What's up y'all, Shuffle, welcome back to the new player guide, so this is part two, and this is picking up where the last one left off, so in this one we will talk about how to manage your hamlet, which is your base, the town, and we will also talk about how to build teams and what to look for in heroes. So if you enjoy the content, make sure you check out the description below, there's a bunch of social media stuff like following me on Twitch, joining Discord, and if you really like the work then you can support on Patreon and get all kinds of super cool perks. So thank you, and now we'll start the video. This is our victory screen here. So if you have leftover supplies that sells them, and then all the gold you found gets counted out, so your items get sold automatically, and then this total here is added to our mission reward of 5,000 gold, and then these heirlooms are used to upgrade buildings, and this is how many we found, and it counts all those out. Quirks, so these are the passive things I was telling you about. So we went from level 0 to 1, pretty nice you can only go up to level six we got two xp and then we got a quirk this could be good or bad we don't know what it is yet it's bad it's very bad so slow draw minus four speed on the first round so this goes away after the first round thankfully but it's pretty bad it means you're basically going last or close to last there's a lot going on with the town screen here so you can always check to see your entire weeks this always goes back down to week one so you can see what you've been doing it keeps track of what heroes you're taking care of, what they did in the week between the mission, or like after the mission or whatever it is. And you can see who you healed or who you brought, items they got, items they lost, stuff like that. Who went on what mission, if they were successful or not. So that's pretty cool. So it says, they uh, successfully escorted me to the hamlet. The player is the heir of the ancestor. They are not one of these characters. So you're just kind of like this general. Kind of like XCOM or stuff like that if you played that, where like you're the, the commander, the faceless commander making all the choices. Probably should have started from here. But this is the hamlet, this is the town that you get control of for the entire campaign. It has various buildings that don't unlock instantly, but the longer you play, it only takes about four or five weeks to unlock everything. And then you get one over here too. So this is where you're doing a lot of your stuff. You can see like the dungeons and stuff in the background, which is pretty cool. So we're going to start with the Stagecoach. This is like the lifeblood of your game for the first few weeks. I mean, it's just always the lifeblood, but its biggest impact is probably in the first like quarter to one third of the game. So you come here and new heroes are randomly generated and they're put in the Stagecoach. So if you want to look for new heroes, if your roster is not maxed out, then you come here and you look for heroes. You look at what skills they came with, what camp skills they came with. We'll talk about camping later. They don't come with gear, usually. And then quirks, we can see what passive stuff they have. So this is minus 10% stress, that's pretty good. Ruins phobe is plus 20% stress in ruins, which is a region, that kind of sucks ass. And so these other stats, these are pretty self-explanatory. So protection is armor, so this is a percentage. Damage reduction, dodge is chance to not get hit, so getting hit and dodge is a combination of accuracy so for instance this has accuracy of 95 my dodge is zero which means I do not affect this in any way but someone like highwayman who has 10 dodge against this pistol shot which is 85 accuracy would lower it to 75 percent chance to hit pretty easy right max HP self-explanatory speed we explain that accuracy mod any bonus chance to hit crit very easy to understand damage also easy to understand and we talked about resist before. So death blow is interesting because when you hit zero HP, you actually don't die. You hit a state called death's door and then you have your death blow resist against whatever damage you take to not die. So anything that does one or more damage has a chance to kill you at death's door and it's a 33% chance baseline. This can go up and this can go down depending on stuff, but most of the time it is a two-thirds chance to survive that is not great odds for you or those are not great odds i should say which means that getting to death's door is kind of scary it's always a tense moment and even if you are bleeding for one point of damage that can still kill you so damage over time effects get much more threatening at death's door than they normally are so just make sure you're not bleeding when you're low hp because something can hit you and then they can actually kill you there are other penalties associated with Death's Door besides just the chance of dying. There's things like minus damage, minus speed, and then like stress gained if you get hit by stress or just naturally occurring stress. So you really just don't want to go to Death's Door. 
And also, if you survive Death's Door, so you just have to heal someone, even if it's one hit point, they leave Death's Door. And if they get crit for a thousand damage, even though they have one life, they're not going to die. They're just going to go back to Death's Door. So Death's Door is actually interesting because it can give you more time to live than you would otherwise have. But then sometimes it can just not work. <laughs> I shouldn't say not work, but sometimes, like the running joke on my channel is that Death Blow Resist is a myth. Because, like, most of the time my heroes don't even survive a Death Door check, they just freaking die. So that sucks. Otherwise, Death Door just makes a lot of tense moments, and it's pretty interesting. It makes this game different than a lot of other games. Alright, back to the stagecoach. Sorry about that. So we have these two, and we need four to build a full team. Thankfully, they gave us two extra heroes. So she comes with her own passive, she comes with certain moves unlocked. We're gonna take her. Ancestor talks to us. And I'm not going to go into the next battle, but I'm going to explain how this would work. So here is the map for Darkest Dungeon. This is where you pick missions to go to. These two areas are DLC, so if you do not have these installed, you will just see these. And there's still plenty of content in this game with just this stuff here. Right now, since it's the tutorial, we can only pick the ruins. This thing here, this little skull and the, the zero, the higher this number gets, like you'll see, you do missions and this bar fills up. Every time this hits the skull, it spawns a boss. And you have to beat the boss to get goodies and then there are, certain, there are a set number of bosses that show up in each region. But I'm not going to cover bosses in this, I don't want to spoil anything. When you are looking at missions, it tells you what the goal is. Sometimes you can camp. So it says this one does not involve camping because this is short. Longer missions let you camp. This is the level of the dungeon. And this is what you get. Gold, pretty obvious. Heirlooms, we talked about that. We have some right here. I probably should have showed those off. I'll, I think I'll go back and look. And then you always get one trinket reward. The harder the mission is, the more valuable the trinket you get. Bosses always give you the strongest level of trinket once you beat them. I shouldn't say the strongest, but they give you very rare trinkets, which are orange. And those are pretty powerful. So if you get an early boss kill, you can actually get some really good stuff. So just be on the lookout for those and I'll go to a different file that shows these off in a minute but other things to look at in town if you want to upgrade your facilities all of them have this thing in the top this icon except the graveyard where you can click this and you can spend heirlooms which are right here and then you get different bonuses it's usually just some incremental change so for instance increases the number of trinkets that I can buy it starts at two this increases it to four if I do it again, I think it goes up to six, and you kind of get the idea. And then there's usually a second thing that reduces cost. So these are both pretty powerful, depending on what the facility is, of course. So for the Stagecoach, we get quite a few things. So Stagecoach Network, this increases the amount of heroes that we can see every single week here. This is really good, but you don't need more than four, honestly. Like, it's nice to see seven people a week, but for most, or yeah, most intents and purposes, four units is usually enough. So I would not recommend going over four until like super late game when you're just, you know, messing around, you want to get new heroes. And then this one's pretty important. The hero barracks, this increases your roster size. So right now I started 10 and I can increase it to 13. I think it goes up to 29. So that's pretty good. Then experienced recruits, this is usually not recommended for the start of a file or I guess for newer players, it's still fine, but I don't like this one too much just because experience recruits gives you higher level people with good stuff, but you have to have all the other, or I shouldn't say all the facilities, but you have to have the guild hall and the blacksmith really powered up to make use of this. So this is a big investment, and it doesn't really come online until like mid to late game, so I usually don't like it that much. For facilities, let's actually, let's jump out to a different file here. So this is another file that's pretty deep, it's almost at the end. I probably could just beat this game if I really wanted to. It's a town event. So every time like you come back in the week during this game, there are a lot of times you'll get a town event where it just shows this poster and it shows like what the effect is. You know, you get bonuses, sometimes you get penalties. So this is the Hamlet all built up for the most part. I don't, I don't think I have this maxed out. No, I don't. But you get the idea. So for the facilities I'd recommend the blacksmith, super important. This upgrades your weapon and armor. 
So the stronger your weapons and armor get, the more dodge, HP, damage, speed, and crit you get. Which is pretty cool. The Guild Hall. This upgrades the level of your combat skills. So they start at 1, I think 0, and then they level up to 5. And every time they level up, they get more accuracy, more crit chance, and their bonus effects go up. So like bleeds, gain more damage per round, debuffs get stronger, heals get stronger, crit chance goes up. So there are a lot of interesting things that happen with maxing out skills, which means that besides Torchlight, the other big thing to your success, besides building teams as well, will be having the proper levels of skills and gear to make sure that your heroes have the best chance of surviving. If you have level 5 heroes and they have level 2 gear, they're going to die. So you always have to make sure that you're upgrading your stuff and staying on top of this because that's another thing that I see kill a lot of newer players is they don't have their gear and their skills maxed out and they just send people into harder missions and they can't keep up with the damage that they can take and they also can't do enough damage to end fights quickly. So when you look at the map here, there, there are a lot of options. So these are red because they're level 5 missions, but level 3 missions are yellow and level 1 missions are green. Green missions, you can only take heroes that are level 0 to 2. Yellow missions, you can only take heroes that are level 3 and 4. And then red missions, you can take anyone. I should say you can take level 0 to 2, or yeah, 0 to 2 on yellow missions as well. They're just weaker and it's not recommended. Same with level 5. You can do it, but it's just not recommended. So when you're looking at missions, you have a lot of choices. The skulls or bosses, the icons and the surrounding circle and the spikes tell you a lot about the missions. So if it has three spikes, it's a medium mission, which means you get to camp. So you see here we have extra, or we get one thing of firewood, which is pretty cool. And then long missions have five and you get two campings. Long missions actually take quite a while. You know, the, the word long is very explicit in how it describes this. So if you do a short mission, you can do it in probably 7 to 15 minutes. A medium mission is probably about 10 to 20, depending. A long mission can take you like 45 minutes just because the dungeons are so extensive. So I don't usually recommend long missions. They're pretty inefficient in terms of money, but they do have the best rewards. So that's, that is something, the best quest rewards. So if you're trying to level up quickly, medium missions are actually the best. Short missions are the safest. And long missions you just do if you have nothing else or if you're trying to get the trinket. Like I was saying as well, the icon on the map thing shows you what type of mission it is. So this one here that has the weird grid pattern, this is always explore 90% of rooms, which means you have to explore a majority of the dungeon rooms. So these are actually the hardest missions because no matter what happens, you have to explore the majority of the dungeon. Any other mission in the game, like a boss mission, or a collect mission, or some kind of activate mission, or a room battles mission, means you don't always have to explore the entire dungeon. Sometimes you only have to go through half of it, so they are very beneficial. With explore, like I take these if I have to, or if I just don't care, but normally I don't like to take these. I'd rather do room battles if I have a choice, or some of the other media missions are pretty good. This hand icon, this is a gather mission. So you have to go into the dungeon and pick up three things. If you scout it on the map, it'll say quest location, which is pretty cool. And you have to put them in your inventory. They don't stack, so your inventory management is much harder on these missions, but you always get a cool town event for doing these. So be, always be on the lookout for media missions and what town event they give you. So I'm not gonna spoil what they are obviously, but once you get familiar with them, there are some really good ones, and I think each region actually has a very good one to look out for. The chest one is an activate mission. So when you start the mission, if I did this, yeah, I'm just gonna skip that warning. You start with three items, and then I have to find three things in this dungeon, and I have to use these items on it, and that's how I complete it. So like I was saying before, sometimes I can get through half the dungeon, find all three of them, and then I'm just done. So they're actually very short sometimes, which is pretty nice. Since we're here, I may as well talk about this too. So when you are preparing to go on a mission, you will see all the items you start with. Since this mission has camping, it gives me firewood. And this is an activate mission, so it gives me the three items I need. I don't think I can throw these away or waste them, so you're never in danger of losing these items and failing. 
And then whatever other things your heroes bring will show up in your inventory. Sometimes people bring stuff for free, which is pretty nice. Like this anti-venom comes from our plague doctor, so she always brings one of these to the mission. And this bandage comes from our arbalest. So there are a lot of interesting things that the heroes bring. They can bring pretty much everything up here, except for like some of the special stuff. But like, you can bring a shovel, some of them bring medicinal herbs, Antiquarian brings keys, Crusader brings holy water. So sometimes it's worth taking certain heroes to missions just to get one extra provision. Because these are pretty nice and they're helpful. But they also cost money, so they save you money in the long run. When you're going for missions, it's there's like a cheat sheet on how to itemize, but basically the easiest way to think about it is if it's a short mission, you want eight food and two shovels, and then like the other stuff depends on the region. And then if it's a medium and long, you multiply it by two and then multiply it by three. But I'm going to do a provision guide at some point, so don't worry about that right now. But when you're here, you gear out your characters, give them everything you'd want. So for a medium mission like this, I'd probably take 16 food. That's a good amount. I'd probably take three shovels. And then just to be safe, I would take like a couple of each of these. Probably two herbs, two keys. Since I'm in the ruins where holy water is really good, I'd take like three of these. And then if I want to be super safe, I take two stacks of torches. I will use most of this over the dungeon. I won't use all of it, but I will use most of it. So when you are also buying stuff, you can click one at a time, but you don't have to do that. You can actually use shift. So if you hold shift and left click, it'll sell a full stack or it will purchase a full stack. So that's pretty nice. So you can actually decide how you're buying stuff this way. And then the stuff that your heroes bring, you actually can't sell them. So that kind of sucks. If you beat the mission, you still have them. They sell automatically. And then finally, if your mission has camping, you want to bring extra food because when you camp, you have a choice of how much food you want your party to eat because you get different effects. So now that that is done, I think we'll talk about some team building and mission selection. Picking a mission is a very big decision. You'll do it so often, it won't feel like a big decision, but it impacts quite a lot in your playthrough. So when you pick a mission, you look at all the regions, you look at the mission types, you look at the rewards you get, like all of it matters. The heirlooms matter, the trinkets you get matter, the town events that appear matter. Sometimes there aren't town events because it's a short mission, sometimes the trinket's just garbage and you want to sell it, especially this one. Otherwise, when you are looking at these, you have to look at your roster, decide who is fit to go on a mission, and then who does very well here. And then once you've decided that, you start building your team, but then you also have to do some more town management. So if I wanted to go to the Weald for this mission, let's say, like let's say I wanted either this mantra of fasting, which I honestly wouldn't because this thing sucks, and if I wanted this town event, I'd go, okay, so how do I do this? I look at the Weald, and this comes with a lot of experience. I will make region guides at some point, but when you're looking at this, you go, okay, the Weald, what works in the Weald? I know that there are some enemy tactics that I could disrupt, and bleed damage does pretty well here, and stuns are kind of nice. So how would I build a team knowing that? So when I build teams personally, I don't know how other people do it, I go with a card game philosophy, and in card games, like, you know, Magic or Hearthstone, stuff like that, you say to yourself, what do I do to win the game? Like, what is my win condition for this deck? And the same thing applies to when you build teams. What is my win condition for missions? How do I kill monsters? Because you cannot beat any mission in this game without killing monsters. Even if you retreat, it puts the same fight you retreated from in front of you. So you have to go through it if something is behind it in order to clear the mission. So in this case, how do I kill monsters in the wield? Okay, I want to go for a bleed damage setup. Who has bleed damage? Flagellant has ble uh, bleed damage. He has some okay stuff here. Nothing in terms of his negative quirks are bad for the wield that I'm aware of. I think Bloodthirsty kind of sucks. Compulsive sucks, but it's beyond the scope of this. Also, how do I have four things locked in? What the hell? So I go, okay. Bleed damage is big. I'm going to take the Bleed King himself. I'm actually going to put him here because he does okay in both of these spots. And then I go, okay. Who else does pretty good bleed damage? I do like Hellion. Hellion does pretty nice here. Is this Hellion better than my other Hellion? She's not. This Hellion, very suited to the wield. No, like, not only does she have no negative quirks, she has a pretty good offensive quirk, and then she has bonus scouting here. 
So she's really nice to bring here. So I'm actually going to take this Hellion. And so once I've decided I'm taking that Hellion, I've decided how I'm killing monsters. I have two people that do bleed damage. Hellion does a ton of damage. So Hellion's probably going to carry my damage load for the most part. So now I know how I'm killing monsters. How do I make these two better at killing monsters and keep them alive? I'm going to go down here. I'm going to look at other characters. Like, I'm not going to explain all of them. Like, right now, you know, I'm doing guide series and all that. But just to make this quick, I know that Vestal is a pretty solid healer. She's easy to play. Do I have any pro wield things on this Vestal? I have Eldritch Slayer. That's kind of nice. So is Hard Skin. I have nothing here that's really amazing. You know, she has a couple things that are okay, but do I have a better one? I do! Look at this! Wield Tactician. Bonus damage in Wield. Minus stress in Wield. Warns Phobe. This isn't the Warns. The Yips. This kind of sucks. There's just minus 5 accuracy on everything I do. But this is pretty nice. So I'm going to take this Vestal. How do I round out this team now? I have a few options. One really easy one is to bring another support class. I could bring Jester. Jester has no negatives here. I could build him to do well in the Wield. Plague Doctor. Do I have a Plague Doctor that has anything good for the Wield? Not really, but I could still bring one. So, I would probably bring a Plague Doctor here. So what can I do with Pl uh, Plague Doctor now? So if I look at her stuff, I have some Blight attacks, and I have some other attacks that I may not want to use. But since I know how to build Plague Doctor, I know that stuns are good, so I'm going to take all of her skills off so I can pick what I want. So, this is a double stun. It stuns two enemies at a time. I'm going to pick that. This is level 1, so I would normally level this to 5 since she's a level 6 hero. So, this is a bleed attack that she can use from the spot, so I would take this. Same thing with Battlefield Medicine. This is a cure. You know, it heals me. It cures Blight and Bleed. That's pretty nice. I would take this. And then this is another stun that also gets rid of corpses. So, I would take this too. And that's how I would build this character. Now, I would look through Hellion. This is a pretty solid Hellion loadout. It's got a lot of bleed damage between these two moves. It has another move that can hit to the back. And then Flagellant has a bunch of bleed. And then Vestal has a pretty good healing loadout. So I know I'm kind of speeding over what the abilities do, but I'm trying to, you know, have some brevity here. And this looks pretty good. So now that I know that I want to run this team, I would just leave it here. I would pick trinkets later. I'm not going to spend time picking trinkets. That's just a lot to look at. But that's how I would do it. And then I would come here and I would decide, okay, do, do I need to do anything with these buildings before I go? Because these upgrade your heroes when you put them in there. So I can just upgrade her decision, for instance, and just max it out. Pay some extra gold to do that. So now she's ready to go. Actually, I could do my medicine too. So I forgot to level this. And then I have to decide what I want to do with these buildings because... This heals stress, the Abbey. This is one way to heal stress. The Bar is another way to heal stress. I actually like the Abbey more than the Bar, personally. There are a lot of reasons to like the Abbey. The Bar has some negatives to it. Then there's the Sanitarium, which is interesting, because in the Sanitarium, you have the Treatment Ward for Quirks, so I can put this Grave Robber in here, and if I wanted to lock in some Quirks, I could click this, so you get the lock. Now I will never lose this, and it costs a lot of money. And then I could also get rid of this at the same time. So I could spend 12500 And then I could click this button to confirm her being in here. And she would be in here for the entire week. So while my party is adventuring in the dungeon. She is getting this service of changing her quirks. And that's pretty nice. So when you are going out. You have a lot of management to do with the rest of your roster. Like I could put someone in here to start stress healing them. Because the... Abbey is a stress healing facility. I'm going to take this guy, actually. So if I wanted to heal all of this stress here, he has uh, 74 out of 200. I would put him in there. I would click this. He's stuck in there for at least one week. Sometimes it can be more. And so while I'm out here adventuring, he would be healing. So you always have to make sure you're doing stuff with your facilities before you go out adventuring, which is one of the hardest things to keep up with. I was going to talk about camping, but I decided that there are a few things I can cover at the same time here. So... This is a fight that's about to end. This thing is going to bleed out to the bleed damage here and just die. There's nothing it can do about it. And we're on turn three. You notice our light is maxed out right now. This is the team that I was talking about bringing here, so it's doing just fine. I switched files because I didn't want to play that file. I played a different file. So we're this far into a medium wheeled mission. 
and this fight's about to end. So I've been talking about light level and manipulating it and stuff like that to get the most out of your advantage. So right now, I have almost max light. This fight's about to end. And I'm gonna camp. So I'm gonna show off a few different things at the same time. So when I mouse over this, uh, the torch meter, I can hold control and then shift. I don't know why it's not showing the controls here. I can hold control and click it. That wasn't supposed to happen. Is it shift? Yeah. I can hold control and click it and it burns a torch. I can hold shift and click it and it goes down by one level. I can also hit T for the torch. I don't have to hold control to do this. I can just hit T. And it uses one torch. One torch is equal to 25 light. So you need four torches to max out. Pretty easy to get. But I want more chances at loot from this encounter. I have one plus on loot. That's pretty cool. But if I hold control and shift, it's not just shift. I can do shift and get through it like this. But if I max back out, if I'm at max, I can hold control and shift and then left click. And it wipes the entire torch out. So you see here, pitch black, it changes, it gets scarier. The stress goes up, monster damage goes up, crits go up, surprise goes up. But look at your loot chance. I know it's a bunch of pluses. I wish it was actually a percentage that it showed the player. But my crit chance goes up and my loot chance goes up. So this means that when this fight ends, it's going to draw more chances of uh, goodies and gold. So I'm going to kill this thing now. The bigger the beast, the greater the glory. And normally, this here is probably what I would have gotten normally. Or maybe these two and this. But this extra gold stack, this is definitely a torchless drop. So this is pretty nice. So now I can pick all of this up, but it gets even better. This is something people still don't know, even like people who've played for a while. You can actually camp with the victory loot window open. So this doesn't work for curio windows. Like I can't open the chest in the background and do this, but if I need space to pick up all this stuff and I don't want to throw things away, you can also throw things away by holding shift and clicking. So shift and left click that tosses it out of your inventory. It's a big part of doing missions where you have to manage the inventory and decide what you're going to keep and not keep. You have to look at how much of the dungeon is left, which items you think you need. And in this case, I want to take all this. So I got rid of that stuff to make space. And now I'm going to right click and use the camp. So once you have the camp window, you can choose to feast, which heals 25% of your HP, minus 10 stress. This heals for 10% of your life, no stress. This heals for nothing, but it saves you the most food. And then you can starve them, which is not recommended. So I'm going to use Feast, and I'm going to heal him for 25. I'm going to cure some of the stress on these heroes. And now I cleared up a bunch of space. Now I can actually probably take most of this. So the only thing I couldn't take was this gold stack, but I can also swap this out. So I'm going to take this instead of the bandage. And I'm done with my inventory. Goodbye, bandage. The reason I have 14 instead of 12 is because I have something called a district, which increases this by two, but normally your camp points are limited to 12. Camping is a huge deal in this game. Camping can do a lot of stuff for you. It can help you recover from a hard fight that you just had. It can give you awesome buffs that help you take on more fights ahead of you or give you scouting in case you're trying to find a secret room or find the best path through a dungeon or if you're gonna go fight a boss you camp before the boss room that way you can get your buffs up and have the best things to tackle the fight with so I camped I have 14 points and each thing costs time so it shows you the time cost and points and what the effect is when you are going to camp in a mission this is when you need to pick your camp skills and it is very important that you plan out your camping you should have the camp that you want to do if everything goes well and then you should have the camp that's like oh crap something happened i took a bunch of damage when you get more comfortable with the game you just put on the camp skills you want and you go okay i could probably use any of these but you still want to plan out what you're doing especially when you get to the campfire itself you want to make sure you have enough points to do everything so i'm going to start with sanctuary it has a bunch of text on here it's not that important for this example, but what it does is it prevents nighttime ambush. 
So when you camp, you have a 1 in 3 chance of getting ambushed in the middle of the night, and that surprises your party, and you have zero torchlight, and it's a group of enemies, and sometimes they can be very dangerous. So if you want to make sure that you aren't ambushed, you would pick something like Sanctuary, or Bandit Sense, or Hound's Watch. There are a lot of different skills that prevent ambush. So I'm going to pick Sanctuary because that's the one this team has. So it took four points. She says something cool. My points are down to ten. And now I cannot be ambushed at night. So now that I have prevented the ambush, I'm going to decide what to do with the rest of my points. So for instance, I have leeches. No one has blights or disease in this team. I can tell by this box here. So there's no point to using leeches. Flagellant is kind of hurt. If I didn't have Vestal and I needed some healing, I would consider this. It takes four points. Big old fat heal. And then for four battles, he has healing received increase, which is pretty nice. That scales your healing that you give to him by 33%. Let's see. I can lower his stress by 15 by pressing encourage. So I'm going to do this. So now he's down to zero. What else can I do? I can make Hellion stronger by giving her 10% crit. That's pretty nice. I can give her 25% damage. Both these are pretty good. There's nothing on Flagellant I want to do. There's nothing on Plague Doctor I want to do. And there's nothing here I want to do. So I think I'm just going to give myself crit. This happens quite a lot when you have skills that cost 3 points, is you have 1 remaining. So usually you have to have 2 that cost 3 to even it out, or 1 that costs 5, which is just 1 in the game that does that. But those are some examples. You can run camp skills that all cost 4 points, so you get 3 of them, or you can run a bunch that cost 2, you can run a couple 3s, you can run like 2 3s and a 4. There are a lot of ways to spend these points, but getting the most out of this gives you the biggest advantages. Since I have nothing else I think, Besides this, that costs one point. Oh, I have the cure. Okay, so I can use this still. It's not much, but, you know, it does something. Now I've used all my points, and I'm going to hit rest. So during these speech bubbles, they're called barks. You can actually click to speed through them. When you camp, it always maxes your torch when you come back to reality, or like the actual mission screen. And then you can go through the mission as normal. So, but for all intents and purposes, I'm done here, in terms of explaining this. And also, when I showed about snuffing the torch earlier, if I didn't have camping, I would have left it snuffed, so I would have got the bonus loot from that fight, and then I could have opened this chest with this key, and then I would have got extra goodies. And if it was torchless, I would have got, like, probably another thing here. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. I don't need any of this right now, so I'm just going to toss it. But that is the camping example. I don't feel like finishing this mission, so I'm actually going to abandon, just to show you what that looks like. But normally, if I was playing, I would go through the rest of the dungeon and try and finish it. It's 100% of room battles, so I'm either going to finish it here, but likely like here or here. So this is still about 90% of the rooms. But I'm going to abandon. You will endure this loss. So since I abandoned, I don't get any of the goodies, but I get to take all the loot out of here, which is pretty nice. And you have a higher chance of getting negative quirks, I believe. So that's kind of bad. I also got a disease. That sucks. Can we go back to town? All the decadent horror and so we had this grave robber recovered stress. I'm on week 450. This file is the first file I ever done, so I mean, all the numbers are bloated. Don't don't pay attention to that. But that is the cycle of play. You do a mission. You come back, you look at the stagecoach, see who's in the stagecoach, like who do you want to take with you, and then you put people in facilities, you heal them up, you lock quirks, and that is how the game is played. So put everyone in, uh, into town activities, go to a mission, come back, get new heroes, do more town activities, go to missions. Eventually you unlock you know, all the bosses, you fight the bosses, you get strong enough to fight the monsters in the darkest dungeon, which is the end game dungeon. Then you go into the darkest dungeon, you do all the missions there, and then you beat the game. So it's it's really fun. And if you're not playing in Stygian or Blood Moon, don't worry about losing heroes, because even if you lose heroes, you will always get an apprentice mission to start over on, and you can always get new heroes from the stagecoach. So it doesn't matter what happens. If you're not playing Stygian or Blood Moon, you can't get a game over and end the game. You can just get set back. So as long as you're persistent, you will accumulate enough advantage to complete the game. You will get enough trinkets, you will get enough 
resources. You will get enough upgrades and good heroes at some point. It may take you 200 weeks, but that's okay. And then you'll beat the game. So all you have to do is be persistent. My final tip is to remember that the game is a total RNG fiesta. It's all dice rolls. You will get lucky. You will get very unlucky sometimes. Oftentimes that is what kills characters. It's some combination of your own mistakes, but it's usually some kind of stupid string of like 5% chances that happen, and that's what kills people. So I'm not going to tell you not to get frustrated. I'm just going to tell you that it happens. You can always look up videos of people getting their ass kicked and feel better because there's misery and you can share in that misery and laugh at them and then feel better about your own situation. So just try and keep a level head and if you need to take a break, definitely do that and come back to it. All right, y'all, that's gonna do it for this video. Thanks for watching. I know it was a long one, so I apologize, but I had to make up for the fastest guide ever by having a super long guide. As I said at the start, if my guide did not meet your needs, definitely go check out other people's stuff. There are a lot of tips. There's Discord. Not just my Discord, there's the official Darkest Dungeon Discord, there's Reddit. Super helpful people on Reddit and the Discords. Go check it out. And as far as my stuff goes, I stream on Twitch, so go follow that. The link's down below. I go live like four days a week. I make videos here on this YouTube channel, obviously, and I have a Discord that has like 500 people. Very cool. Lots of helpful people. So join it if you want some more tips and you don't want to wait for my videos. Next time is probably the Antiquarian Guide alongside the other stuff I've been uploading. And that is it. I'm going to drink a full glass of water because my throat is absolutely dried the hell out. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.